very grateful to be with all of you today. I welcome you to Radha Gopinath Temple. When at the beginning of the Bhagavad Gita, in the great Mahabharat. Krishna accepted the role of the chariot driver for Arjuna. Arjuna is Krishna's devotee. Krishna is Parabrahman. who the Vedic scriptures declare as Bhagavan, the Supreme Brahman, the source of all avatars. And as we read in the first chapter of the Gita, Arjuna fell into a state of great bewilderment. Still, because he was the Lord's devotee. Krishna accepted the role of the driver of his chariot. And Arjuna told Krishna, take my chariot between the two armies. I want to see who has assembled here today. Krishna, obedient to the instruction of Arjuna, drove the chariot between the two armies. And then Krishna spoke, Arjuna, see who has assembled here today. And Arjuna saw so many family members on both sides. Whenever I come here to Radha Gopinath Temple and sit here and look out at all of you, I always remember these words of Krishna, see who has assembled here today. <laughs> but you are, uh, it's such a pleasure to see everyone assembled here. But we are all on the same side, so it's so <laughs> Very beautiful. When we gather together for the purpose of bringing each other closer to that highest purpose of life, loving devotional service to the Supreme Lord, then spiritual intimacy can grow between us. And ultimately this is the intimacy that the heart is yearning for. Lord Chaitanya asked Ramananda Rai, what is the greatest form of distress? And Ramananda Rai said, to be separated from your devotees is the only distress I know. When we share Krishna with each other, Krishna, the one supreme being who is the father, mother of all living entities, who is all attractive, Krishna reveals himself in most special way when devotees share that remembrance with each other. This is the special feature of kirtan or san kirtan. Nama chintamani Krishna's Chaitanya Raspikra. 
that the, the Supreme Lord or Krishna has descended within the name. Nam Nam, Lord Chaitanya prayed, Nam Nam Akarida Nija Sarva Shaktish. That the beauty, the sweetness, the power of that absolute truth, Sri Nanda Nandana, is within the name. It's a transcendental sound vibration. Golokera Premadana Harinam Sankirtana. The sound vibration has descended from the spiritual world. Krishna reciprocates when we chant the name with humility and devotion. When we come together to hear and to chant, the actual spirit is we are sharing Krishna with each other. And in sharing Krishna with each other, together we are offering our hearts, like one heart, for the pleasure of the Lord. The ahankar, the false ego, creates so many differentiations. So many different conceptions of who we are, what we want. And therefore, in this age of Kali, where ahankar, or the ego, is so strong, there, we are so vulnerable to quarrel and hypocrisy. It is practically everywhere, on every level of life, the potential of quarrel and hypocrisy. Because everyone wants to have their own interests, either individually or collectively, as the center, the focus of life. And because there are so many different mentalities, every living entity has a individual unique, unique mentality. There are no two people in all of creation that see anything exactly in the same way. Because whatever we see is filtered through our ego, our senses, and our conceptions. What is our desires? What is our aversions? What are the conditionings of what we've been through in our life? All of our experiences? No one has had the same experiences. And therefore no one sees anything or anyone the same way. It's quite incredible. Recently, I was in Chicago, and it was snowing, so much snow. Everywhere you went, it was halfway up to your knees almost in snow. And I just have these chapels from India. And <laughs> but anyways, I was just looking out as far as the eyes could see and I was driving on a highway, and everywhere I was going, miles and miles and miles, on each horizon on either side, was nothing but white snow. And I was thinking that in the entire span of creation, there has never been two snowflakes that are exactly like each other. Did you ever see a snowflake under a microscope? It's actually very beautiful. It's very artistic. It's an incredible design. Symmetry, balance, and each one is unique. Similar, but unique. And we, see, we just see snow, we just see whiteness. But when you look at it under a microphone, I mean, a microscope. Microphone. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
you see something completely different. Now you have your Chopati beach just a couple blocks away. And it's become quite clean compared to years before. Years before it was like Chopati toilet. <laughs> I used to, because Srila Prabhupada you would used to like to walk along the ocean side and the beach, so I would think, let me do that. And it was quite um, an adventure trying to <laughs> avoid other objects <laughs> that people were placing on the beach. But now it's better, I think. But how much have you taken interest in the sand on the beach? I'd like to show you all a photo someone sent me. This one lady from California. She sent me a photograph of a magnification of ordinary sand on the beach. Incredible. There's stars and crescent moons and unbelievable colors and unbelievable shapes. It actually looks like a paradise. And when you just look at the sand, it just looks like every grain of sand's the same. But when you look at it under a microscope, this, I don't know how many times magnified, Every grain has a special shape and a special color and a special texture. And it's actually amazing. It's beautiful. It looks like unbelievable engineered artwork. But that artwork with all its uniqueness and design and texture is so small that our human eyes have no ability to even appreciate it at all. Just looks like sand. <laughs> so the perspective we have in this world is so limited. We're seeing everything according to how we are programmed. Our eyes are only programmed to see a snowflake in a certain way or a grain of sand in a certain way. Our ears, everything, our minds are programmed not only to see it in a certain way but to interpret according to our own experiences and conditionings in life. To see through the eyes of Krishna, as he is giving to us through gurus, through sadhus, and through shastras or scriptures, is to actually envision, experience life on a transcendental platform beyond the ego. And that is the actual fruit of spiritual life. To rise above the ego that divides us. When we are divided from Krishna within our heart, we are also divided from each other. And union is so conditional. Srila Prabhupada explains the United Nations. Everyone has their own flag and everyone has their own interests. 
and everyone's united, they're only united to the extent is that they have their own personal interests fulfilled. Which is a good thing in this world, but it's not very deep or sustainable. But when we actually understand our common interest, that we are all part and parcel of Krishna. We are all eternal souls. And this whole material creation is an incredible facility to realize our own potential and to realize our potential loving relationship with each other. Happiness, distress, honor, dishonor, pleasure, pain. The beautiful sand and the things that people sometimes leave in the sand, which makes it not beautiful at all to the senses. Everything, everything is a facility to understand our relationship with Krishna. And when we focus on that, then we can have deep relationships with each other that are transcendental to the ego and all of its incredible creations. This morning, Sri Dhammaji was asking, how is it that sometimes in practicing our devotion, we become hard-hearted toward others? Is that your question, Sri Dhammaji? Sri Dhamma has his special reserved seat over there. <laughs> I know exactly where he's going to be every class. <laughs> Seems like there's special reserve seats for you. <laughs> but so often that is what happens. That's not about Krishna consciousness. And that's just about the ego. We're trying to free ourselves up through Krishna consciousness. In today's world, in the name of God, in the name of religion, there's hatred, there's hard-heartedness, there's egoism. Everything that true spiritual life is meant to overcome the whole purpose of it is contradicted when it makes us hard-hearted and egoistic. In bhakti, we become hard-hearted to the selfish, egoistic urges of the mind and senses. But that is supposed to make our heart very soft. It makes our heart very soft toward loving God and compassion toward others. Tomorrow is the disappearance day of Uddharandat Thakur. He was a very special devotee of Lord Nityananda Prabhu. And Krishna Das Kaviraj Goswami and Srila Prabhupada and Aracharyas, Vrindavan Das Thakur, when they talk about Udharan Das Thakur, they especially focus on a very special, essential lesson that Lord Chaitanya came to teach us. that in bhakti, 
or on this true spiritual path. It is the quality, the essential character that is important. In the world today, so often, we take things according to external appearances. Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu made the Namacharya, the person who was the topmost teacher by his character and by his example, Haridas Thakur, who happened to be born in a family of outcasts. And this was 500 years ago, when especially the Vedic society or the Hindu society was predominated by the teachings of Brahmins that very much looked at those outcasts with disdain. That it was impossible for them to attain self-realization. The best they could do is serve the Brahmins and obey them, and then in their next birth they would get a better chance. That was the way it was. Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu extolled the glories of Haridas Thakur as if he had many, many mouths. He said, I am touching you for my purification. Because Haridas's character, because of his deep faith, because of his profound ability to forgive others who have tried to harm him, his ability to tolerate the temptations of illusion. Maya Devi, in so many forms, tried to distract him, but he was focused on the holy name. Beautiful prostitutes and Maya herself appear to him in a lonely place to distract his attention. But he was faithful to the holy name. And then another distraction. He was, he was blasphemed, he was dishonored, he was sentenced to die for doing nothing wrong, he was tortured, he was beaten, he was thrown at a river like a piece of trash, taken to be dead, and he forgave them. Not only did he forgive them, but he went back to give them another chance. <laughs> In this way, he was tested. Would he be angry? Would he be vengeful? His heart was pure. Because ultimately we're all pure souls, whatever body we're in. Whatever sex or caste or race, whatever social status, we're all pure, eternal, loving servants of the Lord. That is the nature of the Atma. Jivera Swarupoy Krishna Ranityadas. And to realize that, to understand that, is what a saintly person is meant to be. Udharanda Thakur, 500 years ago, was born in a family and society that religious people wanted nothing to do with. Especially the Orthodox society. Now today, it is a society everyone wants everything to do with. He was in a society of gold merchants. 
Now in those days, gold merchants were notorious for being materialistic and greedy as anything. And they were considered by many to be the least likely to ever take to real spiritual life. Because they were so distracted by their greed for money, by their greed through their gold. So he was born in such a family. And Nityananda Prabhu showed his mercy to Udharanda Thakur, as did Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. He didn't leave the family. He was, he was extremely wealthy. <laughs> he had everything. And Nityananda Prabhu, after visiting Kardaha, which is a place that later on he would make his own home, he went to Saptagram, the place of Udharanda Thakur. And by the time Nityananda Prabhu came there, Udharanda Thakur had already been giving Harinam, the holy names of the Lord, the knowledge of Srimad Bhagavat, Bhagavad Gita, to everyone. And all these people came to welcome Lord Nityananda with profound humility, respect, and devotion. They were inviting him to, a, to, to their homes. And Nityananda Prabhu was accepting their prasad because they were, they were great souls. And they were having kirtans in the street. Vrindavan Das Thakur said, there was no such ecstatic kirtans anywhere as in Saptagram. And they were all from the caste of gold merchants who were considered the most hopeless. One person, his devotion transformed the entirety of the society around him. In fact, Srila Prabhupada writes that when he was a, a child, his parents would bring him to Saptagram, to that temple of Udharanda Thakur. So, so special. Recently, I was in Gaya. Gaya, the two avatars of the Lord who have appeared so far in Kali Yuga, both had special transformations in Gaya. There's Bodh Gaya, Lord Buddha. According to Jayadev Goswami, Keshavadrita Buddha Sarira. Jai Jagadisha Hari. And Srila Prabhupada quotes many times from the Srimad Bhagavatam the prediction about 2,400 years before the Bhagavatam describes how the Supreme Lord Vishnu will appear in the province of Gaya as Buddha. And according to the histories, he was a king, or a prince, the son of a king. But when he witnessed old age, disease, and death, even though he was surrounded by all luxuries and pleasures, when he saw those things and he understood they were inevitable for everyone, whoever we are. Krishna through material nature gives us a good lesson. On a spiritual level, we are all eternal souls. We're all united, we're all related. On a material platform, 
whether we're billionaires or whether we have nothing material, whether we're scholars or whether we're illiterate, whether we're from the East or from the West, whatever our situation may be, we have to grow old, we have to get diseased, and we have to die. It's true for every type of human. And in that sense, we have so much in common with the birds and the fish and the animals and the insects. Old age, disease, and death. It's like a common denominator that somehow or other brings us to understand, ultimately, we have so much in common. So with all his luxuries and all of his future of power and influence, what's the use? I have to grow old, get diseased, and die, and so many people are doing it. How can I save myself from that? And unless I save myself, how can I help others? What's the use of helping others unless we could actually help them in that way? So for years he traveled and studied and did different tapasyas and then in Bodh Gaya, according to the history under that people tree, he sat and that's where he was enlightened. And just a few miles from there is the temple of the Vishnupad. That temple has been there for a long, long time. And interesting, one of the main messages, according to Srimad Bhagavatam, of Lord Buddha was to crash through this sectarian, materialistic consciousness in the name of religion. Because at that time, animal slaughter was the primary type of ritual in India. The Brahmins, they were actually inspiring this. And Buddha taught ahimsa. That true dharma is compassion and respect for all living beings. And just near the people tree, there's another tree. And there it explains, when he first came out of his enlightened state, he taught that a real Brahmin is not by birth, but by quality. He's Vishnu. <laughs> Krishna teaches that in Bhagavad Gita also. So specifically what his followers' philosophy and his philosophy, that's another subject. But this principle to crash through egoism, to crash through, crash through the sectarianism and manipulation and exploitation in the name of spirituality and religion was very much a part of his mission as Lord Vishnu. And the next avatar of Vishnu that came in the age of Kali was Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. And from Navadweep, where he was living in the role of Nimai Pandit as a great scholar, he took permission from his mother, Sachi Devi, to go to Gaya to perform the last rites for his father who had recently passed away, and for all of his forefathers and mothers. <clears throat> 